ان شاء الله ستارت اور توك السلام عليكم This uh, lecture today will actually, I mean, is a replacement for one of the nucleoplastic um, uh, uh, subspecialty lecture to give in, but because of certain um, uh, conditions, uh, they ask to replace it. So I, I get this is non-planned uh, subspecialty lecture for uveitis. So we'll focus only in the ocular emergencies in uveitis. Uh, by far, this um, talk will cover most of the uh, uveitis entities that you could encounter in your um, career in, in emergency especially. So uh, uh, to deal with the uh, uh, emergency in ophthalmology and in uveitis in particular, you need uh, to have uh, 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 use your um, uh, clinical skills and sense in realize and um, uh, uh, the most essential symptoms and signs that reflecting the true ocular emergency, especially in uveitis. Some patients might come with uh, uh, some uh, complaint. It might be uh, go with the, with the emergency uh, situations or might be just only uh, symptomatic. So why the uveitis patient is seeking help in emergency room? This is a question that we have to ask ourselves when we are seeing a patient in in, in, uh, in emergency room. So the patient might having an acute attack of red eye, pain, photophobia, that could be associated with perifusions or loss of vision, uh, uh, and that could be with floaters or not. Um, in generally, is the complaint of acute onset or secondary to acute complications of previous diagnosed uveitis. So we have two issues here. Is it a new things that the patient is having or it might be the patient already known to have uveitis and this is the new complaint is uh, a secondary to complication of known uveitis. The acute complication of uveitis could include flare up of pre-existing uveitis, sudden increase in the intracranial pressures or Sometimes if the patient's coming with loss of vision, might be secondary to vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment. So we are dividing the uh, uh, emergency in uveitis, either symptomatic emergency or functional emergency. What will be the symptomatic emergency? Mostly this is where the patient giving complaint of functional when the patient is loss of vision or having some uh, visual field defects. So acute attack of red eye, pain, photophobia, and plurifusion, we have to realize that might be the main signs or symptoms of anterior uh, acute anterior uveitis. And that's mostly secondary to primary effects of uveitis either in the iris or ciliary body. Acute loss of vision, usually uh, uh, related to posterior uveitis, either involving the optic nerve or the macula or the main vascular supply of the posterior segment, retinitis or choroiditis. Is it only fission treating or might be associated with systemic condition related? And that's an important for us as might some of the uh, systemic associated with the fiatis might be life-threatening rather than only visually threatening conditions. So usually there is adequate types to complete investigations before initiation of systemic therapy, except in the emergency situations like patient with uh, involvement of the optic nerve or the macula like acute retinal necrosis or occlusive vasculitis. So this is the most uh, things that we have to think about it when we have acute loss of fusions. Usually we have basics to start with short initial history and most of the time I focus only in the complaint of the, of the patient. If the patient having photophobia, or the patient having uncomfortable eye, or might having loss of vision. From that point, I will start to do uh, clinical examinations. And by examination, I can find a lot of signs that might direct my full history of that patient, either ocular, or might be to, exclude, to include systemic uh, history. 
Then oriented history based on clinical examinations. Use your local data, epidemiological data from the area, and then use your uh, uh, simple UFIATIS classification, acute, intermediate, or uh, bestial or ban UFIATIS. Sometimes you might have an intermediate UFIATIS with more prominent anterior uh, UFIATIS symptoms or the opposite anterior UFIATIS with more uh, intermediate or anterior uh, uh, intermediate UFIATIS. Then use your basic lab investigation to verify your uh, differential diagnosis. Then if you need some sort of special investigation, you can uh, order it. After that, use your clinical evolutions, make your diagnosis based on your finding from all these parts of the examination, and then you can direct your treatment. So photophobia, redness, mostly meaning acute anterior fiatis, wild floaters, fuzzy blurry visions. Usually you have to think about something in the vitreous. Uh, scotoma, usually an aphocyte, either in the retina or the optic nerve. And then photopsia, the, that means the inflammation involving the choreocabillaris in cases of white dot syndromes. Investigation, usually we have two types of investigation that we look for. We have the essential investigation, and this is usually do it either to look for the uh, most probable diagnosis or when you are going to, uh, to treat patients with systemic steroid or immunosuppressive medication, then you need to make sure that your patient is legible to be treated with this systemic treatments. <clears throat> In cases of uh, anterior acute uveitis, then we have to make our comprehensive evaluation, including dilated fundus exam, and the treatment mainly depending on the topical treatment or uh, local treatment in the most of the cases. <clears throat> what are the differential diagnosis of acute loss of vision in uveitis? I think most of you that having a lot in their mind, but among this important and need to be uh, diagnosed immediately, acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, CMV retinitis, toxoplasmosis, Bajet's disease with posterior segment involvement, FKH, and sympathetic ophthalmia. So this is the most cases that you have to be aware when you are dealing with the patient in the emergency room with a possible of uveitis complaint. Acute retinal necrosis usually affecting healthy adults or sometimes immunocompromised patients, but most likely this patient usually uh, medically free, and they come with the acute, uh, mostly either blurry vision or loss of visions. Usually caused by herpes simplex virus 1 and 2 or uh, Frazella zoster in uh, older ages. We have two peaks at the younger age, 2030, and the second one at 50, 60. And this is in the younger patients usually related to herpes simplex virus uh, 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 two or herpes zoster in older ages. Usually unilateral, but in 30 percent might be bilateral. And you have to be aware about that as this is blinding disease, you have to have the diagnosis immediately. Uh, the second eye might be involved after several days or uh, several years. Clinical feature, most of the patient might present with red eye and loss of vision. So two things together. The most important is loss of vision. So you have to dig in your history regarding the visual uh, 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 symptoms in that patients. Anterior, usually they have episcleritis or scleritis. Sometimes anterior fiatis with fine or gramatous cavities, as we see in this case, and might be associated with increased intraocular uh, pressure. <clears throat> Bisterior, which is the important, and to be familiar with the exam of fundus in this patient, usually they have fetritis, and most of the patients were severe. Uh, if you look for the peripheral retina, or sometimes in neglected cases, it might be extending to involve the equators, and they have occlusive retinal vasculitis, and that one of the involving the arteries more than the veins. Sometimes it might be associated with strength of hemorrhages, as we see here in this patient, so this is not unusual. Uh, 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 situations, and as we see here, the blood fissure were already having sheathing. <clears throat> Usually having one or more foci of retinitis. 
as you see in this, or it could be having involving the peripheral retina as we see as batches of circumferential retinitis. Optic nerve in severe cases usually having some sort of involvement with neuritis and associated with disc swelling. Standard diagnosis criteria for uh, acute retinal necrosis, usually one or more for site of retinal necrosis with the secret border in the peripheral retina that rapidly uh, uh, progress of the disease over the peripheral retina uh, and usually traveling or moving in circumferential separate of the disease. Uh, the evidence of occlusive vasculopathy, as we say, and prominent inflammatory reaction in the fetus uh, that sometimes extending to the anterior uh, retina. So this is the criteria that we have to put it to have the standard diagnosis of. As most of the time, the diagnosis usually is clinical. It's not based on the uh, lab finding, but it could be supported or documented by some investigation. We can take uh, AC tab or vitreous tab and that's found to be positive in 80% of the patient. And the important of that to identify the type of virus that leading to the acute retinal necrosis. Diagnostic vitrectomy, it could be used in atypical cases and uh, samples uh, 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 used for cytology and BCR to rule other causes of uh, uh, differential diagnosis like toxoplasmosis or bacterial retinitis. It is considered to be top of high emergency in uveitis and need to be treated by intervenous acyclovir 10 milligram per kg per day in three divided doses or foscarnate uh, 10 to 14 days. <clears throat> Intrafetrial gun cyclovir in dose of 0.2 to 2 milligram per 0.1 ml or fascornate 1.2 milligram per 0.2 milligram. This is the treatment standard for acute retinal necrosis. Sometimes the patient might be sick and cannot be used the systemic medication, so try your best to give the patient at least the intrafetrial uh, uh, antiviral treatment. And this treatment needs to be monitored as this patient might be subjected to dehydration and that might be to renal impairment. So you have to put your eyes on and do your electrolytes and renal function in routine basis weekly. Antithrombotic therapy with heparin could be used to decrease the uh, vascular occlusion in such cases, but this is still controversial. <coughs> Steroid treatment is really uh, uh, recommended in this patient to decrease the uh, inflammatory destructive uh, damage that could be secondary to the uh, viral uh, infection. So usually we're starting the steroid after we're starting our antiviral by at least 48 hours. Surgical treatment in this patient, it might be used in a patient that with the necrotic uh, aggressive retina in the periphery and could be uh, 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 used laser photocoagulation to separate the healthy retina from the necrotic retina. Although this is not actually without complication, but we have to use uh, light laser at the edge of uh, healthy retina and the necrotic retina. Barsa plan vitrectomy, it could be indicated in cases where there is vitreal attraction. Some of the uh, surgeons, they used to uh, do vitrectomy in early stage so that they can prevent the possibility of retinal detachment by these vitreous tractions. But actually, it is one of the difficult situations at all the retina is necrotic, and then you have to use uh, uh, silicone oil as permanent uh, uh, tumbinad in these cases. <clears throat> Complications, retinal detachment in 75% of the patients, ischemic neuropathy, optic atrophy, arterial occlusions, uh, macular necrosis and uh, 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 retinal pigmented changes, cataract, and complication lead to blindness, and only 30% of patients maintain a visual acuity of uh, uh, 2050. So most of this could be prevented in the cases of early diagnosis, so you have to prepare yourself to detect these cases in early stage 
and with the medical treatment and laser surgical treatment, it might be able to maintain the patient vision in a good status. Progressive outer uh, retinal necrosis. This is very severe retinal necrosis, secondary to herpes zoster virus, and affects HIV-infected uh, patient. And the history of zoster in 75% of this patient, unilateral involvement in 70 40% at presentation, and but could be extended to bilateral in 70% at least in the uh, uh, long follow-ups. Risk of blindness is highly in these patients. Usually associated with rapid, rapid visual loss and visual field uh, constrictions. Uh, in the clinical feature of the this uh, patient, usually they have normal and quiet anterior chamber in comparison to the acute retinal necrosis. They have clear vitreous. They have massive deep areas of retinal necrosis with homologies and occlusive arthritis with optic neuritis. So this is in the opposite side of acute retinal necrosis in immunocompromised patient, and mostly this is affecting the posterior pole of the retina. <clears throat> Usually they have rapid aggravations with poor prognosis, the retinal detachment in 80% of the patient, and uh, ended by no light perception in 67% at one month post diagnosis. 50% usually they passed away five months after diagnosis. It is considered one of the high emergencies in the uveitis and treatment with combinations of intravenous, fast cornet, and gancyclovir. Intrafetral gancyclovir usually is giving immediately in this patient. We don't have to forget to do CNS workup in this patient as the disease it might be affecting the uh, CNS vasculatures. <clears throat> Other modalities that could be presented as uh, a case of if, uh, emergency in uveitis is cytomegalovirus, and this is double strand DNA herpes virus, and 40 to 100 percent of adults are usually zero positive for CMV. Clinical disease in neonate and immunocompromised uh, patients. Actually, activation of the disease occurs more in the immunocompromised uh, immuno uh, patient. In healthy individuals, the virus become usually latent or uh, terminant. <clears throat> the majority of CMV retinitis cases are found in patients with AIDS, 10 to 40 percent of the patient with HIV usually uh, might at any stage have uh, 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 CMV retinitis, but most of the times with the long-standing uh, uh, HIV with low uh, uh, immunity. With the highly active antiretroviral uh, treatment, this incident usually and uh, decreased to the minimal as nowadays. And uh, this is calculated to be 75 percentage reduction in the number of new cases of CMV retinitis. Symptoms usually depend on the location of the retinitis itself. It might be small peripheral lesion that may uh, pass without any symptoms. <clears throat> Most of the symptoms usually decrease visual acuity in 75% uh, of the patient, floaters in around 50%, photopsia in 16%, eye pain, which is not that obvious, seven percent, and scotomas in three percent of the patients. <clears throat> the sign, traditionally, three patterns, as you know, homologic, granular, and frosted branch, as we see. So we have homologic, scrum, eggs with ketchup, as we see in this patient, and this is the most common, uh, you know, uh, 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 CMV retinitis picture that we face. Some cases might have in granular types that with uh, some whitish and uh, homologies at the edge of the acute retina uh, necrosis and the healthy retina, and sometimes might be presented only as a case of frosted bronze angitis. <clears throat> uh, might ended by full thickness retinal necrosis and that retrogomedogenous type of retinal detachment. Uh, Rarely more anterior findings may be included, especially in long-standing types of disease, and that could be associated with vitritis and uh, uh, fine KBs. Papillitis could be found in 4% of the patient. So looking for the difference between CMV and porn, usually the lesion 1 to 3 foci 
while in porn usually multifocals, necrosis usually granular in CMV, while complement in the cases of porn. Retinal hemorrhage is usually typical in cases of CMV retinitis, while it is rare or uncommon on case of porn. Progression, usually slow in case of CMV retinitis, and usually rapid in cases of porn. In the that means usually it's more common with uh, with CMV retinitis, while less in cases of war. And the immunity of the patient with T cell count usually less than 50 in the patient with uh, CMV retinitis. Treatment of CMV retinitis, it's uh, key uh, to affect treatment is the improvement of the immune status of the patient. So usually our uh, uh, aims to increase the immune status of the patient and with you the anti-HIV uh, therapy for all of these patients. So when we are using that in uh, aerial stage of the patient with the HIV, so this is a protective uh, measure to decrease the incidence of or uh, incidence of the CMV retinitis. <clears throat> Usually small peripheral lesions may observe without any treatments. <clears throat> uh, in case of patient with uh, macular involvement, we start with GAN cyclovir, intervenous induction with five milligram per kg twice daily for 14 to 21 days, then that followed by maintenance regimes. And this can cause leukopenia, so we have to look for complete blood count regularly in these patients. Intrafetrial GAN cyclovir, as we mentioned previous, it can be used twice per week for active disease and then once weekly for the maintenance dose. So it is long treatment, not only a short treatment. Other entities that might be presented as an acute stage in uh, emergency is uh, toxoplasmosis, and this is well of the one that account to be the most uh, infectious posterior uveitis. <clears throat> it could be congenital or could be acquired types. Usually, asymptomatic if it is uh, peripheral lesions or acquired types, uh, and it might have an acute flu-like illness that precede the attacks of uh, toxoplasmosis. Symptoms, usually associated with flare-up of retinochoroiditis and usually lead to sudden onset of floaters, visual loss, hazy, uh, hazy visions, or pain that could be associated with photophobia. Usually, as we mentioned, small peripheral lesion, it might be passed without any symptoms. <clears throat> Active retinal disease is necrotizing retinochoroiditis, and your fats might be posterior and anterior in the same times in severe cases. The lesion usually fluffy, yellow-white lesions with indistinct margins and overlying focal vitreous infiltrate in unifocal area adjacent to the an old retinitis. Older pigmented lesions may be in cluster or uh, uh, strings. <clears throat> Fetritis overlining acute Coretinal lesions may be severe or creating what we call head light in the fog. And that's an important. When you see localized fetritis, usually think about toxoplasmosis when you compare it with the patient with acute retinocrosis or other viral lesions. <clears throat> Brief ascolitis, you know, the active lesions might be seen as we see in this patient, and they have ascolitis as that we called it, careless black or lines. <clears throat> in the immunocompromised patient, it might mimic acute retinal necrosis. This is a patient with acute foci of univocal retinitis that showed really any hidden light in fog. And when you are looking for the fluorescent angiography, we can admit the signs of double ring in these patients. Another patient might have only small lesions that adjacent and old scars and associated with the localized fetris as you see in this patient. If it is too close to the optic nerve, it might be associated with uh, 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 neuritis. <clears throat> Another patient with another area of retinochoroiditis with all the scar in the other signs and some sort of vasculitis. Treatment, this is actually, we have two regimen to admit it, the first one, usually classic, for five to six weeks with oral uh, bivitamine and sulfadiazine and fluoric acid. 
and all of you, I think, so is familiar with this, will not go in details. The, uh, the only things you know, could be taken in this regime, you need to see your patient and monitor the, uh, 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 his, uh, you know, that CBC to make sure that the patient is not developing leukopenia. So most of the time, we are using folinic acid to encounter the thrombocytopenia. Other really practical types of treatment using the uh, uh, trimethoprim, salve, uh, uh, methox uh, methoxazole, double strength, like Bactrim, 800, uh, combination 160, tablet 960 milligram, uh, twice per day uh, for six weeks with or without uh, clindamycin. And this combination is actually safe, can start your patient today, and uh, uh, you don't need to do regular uh, CBC as we do in the other regimen. <clears throat> Another entities in this patient is Bahjad disease, and all of you, you know that how much is that Bahjad disease prevalent in our community, and actually it is an idiopathic multi-system disease, and most prevalent in the Mediterranean regions and uh, Japanese peoples, associated with HLA-B5 or B51. <clears throat> Uh, characterized by oral aphthous ulcers in 100% of the patient, uh, skin lesions in 90% of the patient, genital ulceration in 80%, and euphiatis in 70% of the patients. It is more common in males than females, and the mean age of the onset is usually third decades of life. Uh, initial ocular involvement may be unilateral, but progression to bilateral disease in the late in the least two-thirds of the uh, cases. Banifiatis is the most common form in both male and females. Usually the patient complaint, orbital pain, redness, photophobia, blurry fusion, or sudden loss of fusion if the macular or the optic nerve is involved. Hypobia, as characteristic in Bahia disease with anterior uphiatis, and usually change positions with the head movement, and usually form and disappear rapidly without even though uh, any complication or side effect. Uh, complication might be ended by posterior synechia, peripheral anterior synechia, iris atrophy, secondary glaucoma, or cataract in this patient. Posterior segment involvement in the acute stage might have vitritis or posterior hypobian, retinal vasculitis involving arteries and vein, retinal hemorrhages and exudate, Focal retinal infiltrates, cystoid macroedema, and babylitis. Complications on or in clinic stage, patient might have retinal ischemia and found to have neovascular resin at the disc or elsewhere, neovascular glaucoma, optic nerve atrophy, as you see in this patient, attenuated uh, blood vessels, and macular hole with chronic cystoid macroedema complications. Diagnosis of Bahjad disease is based on the clinical findings rather than any laboratory test. And the major criteria need to be on mind when we are seeing a patient with, uh, with, uh, with Bahjad disease as the diagnosis will be made in that. And we have sometimes the patient with Bahjad disease having difficulty to admit that they have Bahjad disease. So usually we are using this form, complete form of the disease or incomplete and suspect and possible one. Using this one, it might help your patient to understand the Bahia disease is not only one disease. It might have certain criteria from full picture to less or possible uh, disease. <clears throat> the treatment goals of the patient uh, with Bahia disease usually focus to rapid resolutions of intraocular inflammation, prevention of recurrent attacks, achievement of co complete remission, and preservation of fusions. And the treatment either medical or surgical in advanced cases with complication of cataract or glaucoma or retinal detachment. And the treatment actually uh, could be divided if the patient having only acute isolated anterior segment inflammation, we can use frequent topical corticosteroid and midretic in the same times. If it is posterior segment inflammation with mild posterior segment unilateral, we can use subtenone capsule corticosteroid injections. In case of uh, severe recurrent or uh, unremitting posterior segment inflammation, this is where the time where you have to use systemic steroids with extremely slow tapering in this patient and 
combined with immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory therapy and biologics. And this is, could be initiated at the time of treatment with steroids. Another entities, it is fake age and could be uh, affected young patient and presented as an acute loss of vision uh, in one eye or on both eyes in the same times. And as you know that FKH is a gramatous, multi-systems inflammatory disease affects the eyes, auditory systems, meninges, and skins, and usually seen in Asian populations, uh, Middle East and uh, Hispanic populations. Children, it could be affected as young as four years of the age. Females are more than males, as you see that Bahjat more in male and FKH more in females. The age of uh, affected in individuals are between 20 and 50 is the productive age and most frequently during third decades. <clears throat> we define the disease in uh, four clinical stages. Prodromal stage were started as flu, viral-like illnesses, euphatic stage, chronic stage, and recurrent stage. In the euphatic stage, the most common symptoms is acute bilateral blurry fusion or loss of fusions. Usually they have bilateral posterior fatis with retinal edema, optic disc hyperemia or edema, and eventually serous retinal detachment. Anterior fatis characterized by mutant fat KBs uh, and iris nodules, especially in the chronic stages. The intracranial pressure uh, may be elevated because of forward rotations of the lens iris diaphragm, and this is most likely in the chronic cases of anterior fats related to FKH. In chronic stage, we see multiple signs and variable depigmentation of the fundus, sunset blue fundus, uh, limbus, segura signs, and we see the fox nodules like co-retinal scars. In the chronic stage, the patient might manifest the vitiligo, olubesia, and uh, 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 poliosis. Recurrent stage, usually chronic, ban euphiatis, recurrent granulomatous euphiatis, and recurrent posterior euphiatis with serous retinal attachment usually is rare. So most of the patient, when they pass the acute stage, usually presented with anterior chronic euphiatis rather than to have oxidative retinal detachment. In the recurrent stage, complications are relatively common during that stage with cataract, glaucoma, choroidal nephascularizations, and subretinal fibrosis, especially in the cases that the diagnosis based on the suggestive clinical symptoms and signs, and salary test finding and the conclusion of other euphetic uh, conditions. Ultrasound in acute stage, usually they have diffuse low to medium reflectivity thickening of the choroids and pre papillary area in the papillary area and oxidative retinal detachment as we see in these patients. <clears throat> when you see these faults of oxidative retinal detachment, that means the patient passed actually the acute clinical stage and now he is in sub or clinical stage past the two or three weeks of the oxidative retinal detachment. Fluorescent angiography, this is helpful in diagnosis of this patient and usually associated with early multiple pinpoint leaks at the level of retinal pigment epithelium with uh, late boiling of dye underneath neurosensory retinal elevation. Uh, other behavior of uh, PKH in the fluorescent angiography might be started with early hypofluorescent spot which later show staining. Optic nerve in this case is usually hyperemic with hot disc. Uh, systemic the treatment of this patient usually depends on the uh, uh, stage of the disease. In acute stage of existing retinal detachment, the treatment usually with uh, steroid and the uh, protocol to start with intravenous methylprednisone followed by uh, oral steroids. <clears throat> and uh, this is need to be extended beyond six months of the treatment after tapering the disease and tapering quickly the steroid in this patient might be associated with increased the recurrency of the anterior fats in these patients. Immuno uh, uh, suppressive therapy like Imuran or Celsept uh, or in cases cyclosporine could be used and initiated with the initial stage. Topical therapy usually used for the anterior 
uh, associated anterior fiatus, and usually we are using prisoner acetate or typical cycloplegia that associated. Other entities that could be presented at an acute stage uh, associated with the loss of vision is sympathetic ophthalmia, and actually it is identical to the uh, uh, sympathetic ophthalmia, with exception of the history of the patient that might have an interocular procedure or trauma. And usually associated with bilateral gramatis, banufiatis, with multifocal choroiditis, and usually following penetrating trauma, ocular surgery, cyclodestructive procedure. It is rare, but lead to bilateral blindness. And almost the treatment, same as case of, uh, of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. This is examples of patient who had uh, a trauma in the other eye and presented with existing retinal detachment that demonstrated by uh, fundus examination, ultrasound, and OCT, and fluorescent angiography. Another patient had cyclodestructive procedure and it did by exhaustive retinal detachment that respond well to treatment and complicated as well with glaucoma. Another patient with phthisis valve secondary trauma and sympathetic ophthalm. So in summary, acute retinal necrosis usually lead to decreased visions, uh, optic neuropathy, vascular occlusions, retinal detachment, progressive outer retinal necrosis associated with vascular occlusion, retinal detachment, uh, cytomegalovirus, retinitis, lead to macul maculopathy, optic neuropathy, and retinal detachment, ocular toxoplasmosis, macular choroidal scarring, glaucoma, macular edema, iberitin membranes, choroidal vascularization, retinal detachment, while in patients with Bahia disease, usually might lead to maculopathy, optic disc atrophy, cataract, glaucoma, retinal ischemia, retinal detachment, and thysis pulvi, FKH, and sympathetic ophthalmia, ended by exhaustive retinal detachment in acute stage, maculopathy, subretinal infascaration, and fibrosis. <clears throat> to make it more simpler, look for the general health of the patients. If he's an immunocompromised or an immunocompetent patient, then consider in young males, acute retinoclosis, Bahia disease, toxoplasmosis, or fecage. If the patient is uh, a female, then look for acute retinoclosis, fecage, and toxoplasmosis. While if the patient having history of previous penetrating trauma, think about uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. If the patient is immunocompromised, then we have uh, consider porn and CMV retinitis. Another criteria could be used to make things easy vitreous obesity. If it is present, then put the patient either having peripheral retinal infiltrate or central retinal infiltrate or exit retinal detachment. In case of peripheral uh, retinal infiltrate, acute retinoclosis is most common in the top of the list, while if the uh, 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 vitreous obesity uh, involving the central uh, vitreous cavity, Bahjad disease and toxoplasmosis among the uh, most common differential diagnosis. If there is an oxygen retinal detachment, then we have to put FKH and sympathetic ophthalmia. If the vitreous opacity is not there, then the uh, uh, central retinal involvement usually think about CMV retinitis, porn, and toxoplasmosis. If it is only peripheral retinal infiltrate, toxoplasmosis among the most common uh, uh, entities that you have to think. So this is by uh, uh, by two. By this, we can conclude our talks about the acute uh, emergency cases in Euphiatis. And if you have questions, I'm ready to uh, answer that. As I, I informed that if the patient already been in the heart regime of treatment, this patient usually they have less likely to develop CMV retinitis. If the patient never been on the treatment, this patient usually when the, you know, that cell count less than 50, this patient prone to have that. And as we mentioned it as a figures there. Um, for you as ophthalmologist might be uh, the first person discover this. 
as we see in patient. My patient never been seen by any ID, you know, uh, consultant or deficient. And then when you see the picture, you have to realize, is this patient having viral retinitis related to uh, CMV or something related to the uh, status of the patient? Most of the patient that diagnosed in the ophthalmology, most likely they are not being seen in the, uh, uh, with the, uh, you know, that infectious consultant. So be careful when you examine. You might have the time to take samples, and this is usually as uh, uh, very well document the uh, virus in the vitreous cavity. If you get the blood, most of this patient, they have it there. But you can not look for the viral load in this patient. The most important, when you see see inferitinase, this patient needs to have treatment. And uh, you might be need to contact your uh, colleagues in the infectious department and to start the antiviral treatment. Your uh, uh, situations here, when this patient is very sick, what you will do? Because you cannot start this medication by yourself. Because this is systemic treatment, the patient might having some sort of needs of systemic evaluation to look if this patient could tolerate the systemic treatment or not. Uh, in this case, usually I start the uh, intrafetorial treatment as this is in my hand, and then immediately to send the patient to uh, uh, infectious disease uh, uh, specialized persons. So suppose that you, yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, doctor, for the great lecture. Uh, now, regarding some patients, uh, you start IV steroid as uh, initiation therapy, and you will continue giving the patient oral steroid after the IV. Okay. Adding uh, another systemic medication. In Bahjad disease? Yeah, the, the entities that we are might be are sometimes you don't know which one you are, either Bahjad disease or fake age, because other types infectious and you know that is to use steroids. In Bahjad disease, you know, usually I start with IV methylprednisone, especially when the foci of the infection at the macula or the optic nerve, which is considered as rescue treatment here. You cannot delay it. Some people, they're starting to do their investigation taking weeks to initiate the IV methylprednisone. This is not advice at all. Look for your patient. Most of these patients are young and healthy. Do your basic CBC, liver function tests, renal functions, and do CT scan of the schist. If these things turn to be normal, then you are immediately, uh, uh, logically, to start your IV methylprednisone. Uh, BBD test or quantiferin will take times. And BBD might take three days, but if the inflammations already there are obvious in the macula, you don't have to wait, especially if you uh, cleared up your patient by history. The patient doesn't have contact with tuberculosis. Patient doesn't have, you know, that uh, schist X-ray seem that clear. I will not. And in three days, that any latent TB will not be provoked. So I will start. If that turn positive, then I can add prophylactic treatment for this patient by INH or by, you know, full treatment if there is CT scan signs. Looking for tuber, uh, for Bahjet or FKH, the preferred treatment in cases of FKH is usually Celsept. Usually we don't have any. For patient with Bahjet disease, we have two types. Systemic disease, usually the rheumatologist like, they like to start with the MURA in these patients. Uh, for uh, for ophthalmology aspects, Celsept found to be in retrospective study is more effective in ocular bahjat more than the systemic disease. But if the patient having already lost one eye and the other eye is having, you know, uh, retinitis at the macula or uh, neuroretinitis, this is the time we'll have to start with biologics. But you have to make sure you ruled out any possibility of tuberculosis. And this cannot be done in one day. But at least rescue treatment with IV methylprednisone should be initiated immediately. So the ophthalmologist in the ER, when facing a patient with uveitis, he should think seriously, is this disease, is a blinding or not? If turn that an acute retinacrosis or see infiltrates, you have to react immediately. You don't have to wait until the last minutes. Okay, thank you, please.
Dobrze, że robią. اصبر شوي ما هو طويل البرزنتيشن يعني خل شوي شلون؟ اي والله كان المفروض ان الاعامه زي يوم عيد خلونا نجيب ما نداوم المفروض احنا جايين اوكي خلينا نشوف
Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everybody here. And uh, today we have the privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Suleiman. Suleiman is a senior consultant, is having a veterinary fellowship from KKH and subspecialty as well in the veterinary of pediatric veterinary uh, disease as well uh, Ufiatis fellowship. Dr. Suleiman is well known. He's one of the uh, excellent researcher in his field. And today he will talk about syndromic retinal detachment, which is one of the tough, actually, cases for these people who's familiar with the uh, retinal, uh, uh, retinal uh, pathology. And I would like to uh, uh, admit him to start his talks and would like, inshallah, to get the benefit and the trip of you with this type of syndromes. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Okay. So today I will discuss with you um, syndromic retinal detachments uh, and uh, highlight some of the controversies and uh, and management of these cases as well as uh, highlight some of the uh, studies that were performed in KCASH and uh, in which KCASH contributed to the literature. So I'll start with uh, this case. Uh, this is an 80-year-old uh, female with high myopia, minus 20 diopters in both eyes. She was brought by her parents because she cannot see anymore. She had counting fingers vision in the right eye and light perception in the left eye. This is uh, the right eye examination, and it is showing uh, uh, total retinal detachment, macula off. Uh, the left eye had white cataract, and uh, this is the B scan, showing open funnel detachment with uh, subretinal cysts. So this is her face. As you can see, she has uh, uh, Midfacial hypoplasia and uh, hypognathia, as well as the the nose is not normal. If you open the mouth, you you see this bifid uh, uvula. So this is all typical for uh, Stickler syndrome. It was first described by Gunnar Stickler. Uh, he's a pediatrician in Mayo Clinic, and it was first described in 1965 as hereditary progressive uh, arthroophthalmopathy. It was originally described as a group of, as a single gene disorder, now recognized to be a group of genetic disorders that involve collagen. It is one of the most frequently uh, inherited connective tissue disorders with an incidence of one in 7,500 uh, live births. It is also the most common cause of inherited and childhood retinal detachment. So there are several types of uh, Stickler syndrome. Uh, type 1 accounts for 90% uh, of cases with a mutation in collagen 2. Um, type 3 does not involve the eye. Type 4 is important to you because it is autosomal recessive. 
There is type one that is uh, there is a somewhat recessive form of type one and uh, autosomal recessive form uh, of type four, which is mostly autosomal recessive. And these are the most common, uh, likely to be the most common ones in Saudi. There is an ocular only phenotype. So it, uh, if you don't see the systemic features, it does not mean that the patient doesn't have stickler. The expressivity of this uh, disease uh, is variable uh, within a family and between families. The vitreous phenotype is classified into the, uh, the membranous type and the beaded type. So um, this is an example of a membranous type. You can see the membrane be behind the anterior hyaloid. And you can see this is the beaded type here. Uh, a common finding in these patients is the witch-shaped cataract. There is a fundus phenotype. It is not very well, uh, the distinction in fundus phenotype is not very well described. So this is a personal observation. Um, I think there are two uh, phenotypes. The type that comes like this. Uh, you can see the patient is, has high myopia, uh, white without pressure, and they come with giant retinal tear detachment. No lattice, no atrophic holes, nothing. Um, and they only just present with giant retinal tear detachment. There is another type that comes with radial lattice, perivascular lattice, um, atrophic holes, and uh, this is important, the distinction between these two uh, uh, phenotypes when we discuss uh, prophylaxis. I'm not sure if these two types are mutually exclusive. So you can have someone who presents with giant retinal tear detachment with these uh, features. So back to our patient. Um, so this is the appearance of the right eye, and she underwent uh, sclerobuckle in the right eye only. Um, personally, I, if, the, if the child can be repaired with sclerobuckle, then it is a sclerobuckle that should be done. Uh, vitrectomy is not as easy as in adults. And this is the appearance of the uh, left eye. So we isolated the rectile muscles. She, has, she had this white cataract. We uh, dilated the pupil mechanically with the iris hooks, and we removed the lens. This is with the 3D ingenuity system. That's why it is a clear uh, video. Uh, you can see the hyaloid is very adherent here. We, after multiple attempts to get an edge, of this hyaloid, um, we stained with triamcinolone, we stained, we stained with uh, membrane blue, uh, with the contact lens. You can see we found this edge of hyaloid just adjacent to the fovea that we could lift up. Um, if this was not removed, and, uh, and this is a, a false belief that pediatric detachments uh, um, are going to fail whatever you do, it is because of this structure. If you don't remove it, they are going to fail because of PVR. So you have to search for it carefully and uh, uh, meticulously remove it. This is a technique that uh, I sometimes use uh, when I use bimanual forceps with a chandelier light in, in order to uh, build the membranes. This when you have two forceps together, you can have a pressure counter pressure, uh, uh, traction counter traction effect with the two forceps. So this is another patient. This is a 12 year old uh, male who lost his left eye due to multiple failed surgeries to repair a giant retinal tear, tear detachment. He presented with acute vision loss in the right eye. So this is his uh, Surgery, we stand with triamcinolone again. And um, here, uh, luckily, there was a complete PVD, which made it easier. So we, we placed berfluorone. 
But there are other ch challenges in, in patients with giant retinal tear. One of the most important challenges is the uh, slippage when you uh, deal with, uh, with the giant retinal tear during the, the, the last steps of the procedure. You can see here the giant retinal tear, perfluoron in place. Um, we applied uh, laser uh, at the uh, edges of the giant retinal tear, and this is a technique that, that I find helpful in cases where there is more than 180 degrees of uh, giant retinal tear. In order to avoid the slippage, you should uh, do the fluid air exchange very slowly. And with this uh, technique, uh, when you stain the fluid with, with the brilliant blue, you get the chance of removing every drop of fluid. And you can see it, it is a blue, it is blue, it is stained in blue. Then you can start removing the perfluorone bubble. Um, I found it helpful. I don't think it is very necessary. Uh, if you are very careful, you can remove the bare floor on, uh, the, you can remove the, uh, the, all the fluid before going to bare floor on. So he recovered his uh, pre-operative or pre-detachment uh, vision. This is the third patient. Um, he has the typical uh, facial features, and uh, if, when opening the mouth, you can see the abnormal high arch palate and uh, abnormal uvula. This is his right eye. As I mentioned, the appearance of total of uh, normal uh, myopic fundus, no lattice, nothing. And this is the left eye. So he has a brisk light perception. Should we do something or not? This is a debatable uh, issue. And um, you may argue that what, what benefit is he going to gain from touching this eye? He's seven, uh, he's seven years old. Uh, the concept of a spare eye is important in pediatric uh, population. Uh, we discussed this with the parents, and they agreed uh, to proceed for surgical intervention. So unfortunately, I don't have video for this one, but uh, you can see this is uh, post-op. He required three lensectomy and 360 uh, retinectomy. Actually, he had almost 360. He had only, only a small area of attachment. Um, but during surgery, um, as you can see, he had this uh, fold in the macula. This tells you that there are membranes. Although we stained with the staining that uh, we use intraoperatively, we could not highlight any membranes. Um, so we decided not to laser the edges of the break, so uh, the edges of the 360 retinectomy. And this helps in giving you space later on to, to, uh, to address this. So this is like a three weeks post-op. Uh, then again, we, we admitted him for surgery, and you can see that now the membranes become more, became more apparent with time. And now we can build them. So this is what we did. We went in and built the membranes, and we did the 360 uh, laser treatment. This image is six months post-operatively, and he improved to two over 200 he may need one more round of uh, membrane peeling. So this is another patient with the appearance that I told you, high myopic uh, appearance. Um, and this is the appearance of the left eye. So this is all folded retina. So uh, the question is, should we do anything to the fellow eye to prevent retinal detachment? So examining the literature, this is a uh, study in 1978 and is the first and only paper that discussed prophylactic scleral buckles. Uh, it contained uh, a heterogeneous group of patients, um, aphakia, marfan, stickler, not only stickler patients. A uh, subgroup of patients with a progressive white width pressure were, were analyzed, and they had, the author had nine eyes who were observed for up to eight, 16 years. 
Six of them developed giant retinal tear, two developed retinal holes, and one I developed retinal detachment. And then he decided, well, let's switch now to doing prophylactic sclerobuckle. And this is what he did, and he had 15 eyes with sclerobuckle uh, with an average follow-up of only five years. And um, none of them developed breaks and, uh, or retinal detachment, and he concluded that prophylactic buckle is helpful in these eyes. So, however, there are small. Uh, this uh, study had small number of patients. There was no. Uh, there was no statistical analysis. Heterogeneous group of patients, and most importantly, this was never replicated again. So, buckle is an invasive uh, technique in highly myopic eyes with thin sclera. We don't know what will happen in 10, 20, 30 years from now, especially if you put it in a child. This is another study that evaluated prophylactic uh, laser photocoagulation, and actually this is one of the uh, important ones. The total number is 44 eyes, uh, 50, uh, divided into 34 no laser, 10 with laser, and 19, uh, 15 of the uh, 34 detached in the, in the non-laser eyes. However, this is a single family, small number, and this is uh, the most important point in this study. Eyes in the non-laser group had detachment prior to enrollment. This is a significant bias. You cannot do this in order to get a uh, meaningful results. The laser technique was not uniform. Sometimes they did focal around lattice, and sometimes uh, they did three, uh, 360. This is uh, from KCASH in 2015. Um, they evaluated uh, uh, around uh, 70 eyes of, of, of patients with stickler, although there was no phenotyping uh, or genetic confirmation of stickler diagnosis. They concluded, in this study, they concluded that uh, prophylactic laser was not beneficial. And this is not what attracted me in this study. Uh, this point is uh, what, what I find interesting. So in, in eyes that re received the prophylactic buckle, uh, prophylactic uh, laser photocoagulation, around 36% developed detachment. And uh, in two eyes, they developed detachment within two weeks of laser. So imagine you are the surgeon, you did laser to that child or that uh, young adult, and he developed detachment after your laser. I think this is the most important study in, the, in this area, this, uh, in the prophylaxis and uh, stickler syndrome, and I don't think uh, other studies, it is not possible. It is not easy to perform studies in this uh, in this disease. It is not very common. So this uh, this is a paper that was published in 2014. Let me go back in history. In 2007, the same group published a paper that was criticized uh, a lot, and they suggested that prophylactic uh, cryotherapy is. Uh, successful in reducing the detachment, so they performed this in a second study. Um, this study is, in, is called Cambridge Cryo Protocol Study. Um, what they do is uh, they do prophylactic cryotherapy at the aura serrata in order to avoid giant retinal tear detachments. And this is done only in, eyes, in patients who have stickler syndrome type 1 genetically confirmed. So they, they had uh, groups that uh, they brought patients who have uh, stickler, no detachment, they did bilaterally uh, prophylaxis, and a group of control patients who did, did not receive anything. And there is another group who developed detachment in one eye, and they addressed the other eye with either nothing or with the cryotherapy. So we have, there are two groups. And they found that if you perform prophylactic cryotherapy 360 degrees at the aura, you reduce the chance of uh, retinal detachment by five folds, from 37% to 9%. Uh, 
the uh, if you do it in a unilateral in one eye uh, where the other eye is detached, which gives, tells you that this patient is high, more likely to detach. Uh, they found that they reduced the rate of detachment um, by eight folds, from seventy percent to five percent. So this remember this is in UK Cambridge. So this is a, a senior surgeon at Morfields, and this is his statement. For every case that you can show me that has benefited from laser or cryotherapy prophylaxis, I can show you a case that has been harmed by it. So moving on to early onset high myopia, um, not all eyes with early onset high, not all patients with early onset high myopia are uh, stickler patients. Some of them are stickler, others are they have genetic mutations that are not genetic, that are not well described in the literature or will not well characterized. But there is this uh, genetic mutation LRPAP1. Um, this is important because it is it is autosomal recessive, and it was described by Arif Khan here. It was characterized by Arif Khan and uh, his colleagues. Um, as I mentioned, it is autosomal recessive. Uh, important finding is that myopia is very high. It ranges from minus 17 to minus 32, with a mean of minus 24. The axial length also is very high, ranging from 29 to 37, with a mean of 33 uh, millimeters. The clinical appearance of the retina, if, if you remember what I showed, the stickler patients I just showed you did, did not have this uh, the, this conus uh, appearance. So they have the typical features of high myobic fundus. But wh what's important is that these patients did not have um, lacrocrax and did not have crowded vascularization. Also, they did not have vitreopathy. So there are no membranes in the vitreous, nothing, uh, not what as what you see in uh, stickler patients. Moving on, this is a, a three-month-old female. She presented with nystagmus uh, and poor fixation in both eyes. This is the appearance of the right eye, total detachment, peripheral break, and this is the appearance of the uh, left eye shallow retinal detachment. We could not identify a break in sedation nor in, in OR. So we did an OCT, handheld OCT, and it showed a slit break in the macula with vitreo macular traction. So her examination systemically showed this skin defect in the scalp area. So um, no block syndrome is a disease that was described by uh, No Block in 1971. Uh, he reported five siblings with high myopia and retinal detachment associated with encephalocele. Um, then the genetic mutation was characterized uh, in 2000 to be in uh, coll collagen 18A1. Again, Arif Khan described the, the, the uh, distinct ophthalmic phenotype of this syndrome. He had eight children ranging from four to 15 uh, years of age, and none of them had significant dysmorphic features. All had this distinctive vitreoretinal degeneration consisting of diffuse, very severe RPE atrophic changes with prominent choroidal vessel show macular atrophic uh, lesions with or without punched out appearance, and they termed it uh, pseudocoloboma, and this white fibrillar vitreous condensation. The ARG was abnormal. All patients, and this is the first uh, paper that described this, all patients had smooth cryptless iridis. Four patients had uh, distinct posterior per perinuclear lens opacity. Six children had uh, timbral ectopia lentis, and all of them had high myopia. 
ranging from 10 to 20 diopters. Not, not all patients had uh, occipital defects, and this is important, uh, which uh, puts uh, weight on the fundus phenotype. Uh, the fundus phenotype in this, uh, in this disease is very uh, characteristic. So apart from the initial paper from uh, by no block, uh, no other papers characterize retinal detachment in these uh, patients. So we describe, he we describe here a, a new form of retinal detachment in, in these patients, patients who present with uh, detachment secondary to macular holes. So this is the same patient that uh, I showed you. Uh, same uh, steps in surgery. She had uh, buckle in addition to the uh, to vitrectomy. And as you can see, we are trying to get the hyaloid off. It's, it's very sticky, very adherent, and especially in the macular area. So we decided to uh, do it uh, by manually. When this is in order to avoid uh, enlargement of the macular hole. Uh, this was uh, followed by a silicon oil injection, and uh, we followed the other eye that I showed you with peripheral break had the same uh, the same procedure uh, with buckle and uh, and uh, vitrectomy with silicon oil. So this is the chandelier that we use, and this is the bimanual dissection of the hyaloid. Um, this is the appearance post-operatively uh, of both eyes, and this is the, opti uh, the OCT showing a flat retina closed macular hole. So we have a total of six eyes of uh, four children. All of them are females. The age ranged from uh, three months to five years, with a median of 5.5 months. The fellow eye of two patients had retinal detachment due to peripheral breaks. Uh, the macular hole was clinically visible in five eyes and detected only by OCT in one eye. This highlights the importance of handheld OCT. The retinal detachment was shallow and extended to anterior equator in all eyes, with one eye presented with uh, retinopathy. Um, there was one paper in the literature that, uh, that was managed as executive detachment because they could not find a break. And I, I am sure that the break was, uh, was very tiny as the, the, the case I showed you. So intraoperatively, the, uh, the findings were uh, as follows. Empty vitreous, firmly adherent posterior hyaloid, especially over the macular area, anomalous BVD with significant vitreous cases. At last follow-up, uh, with a mean of 10 months, four eyes reattached with the closure of the macular hole and one, one detached due to BVR. So this is a uh, five-year-old who presented with long-standing uh, exotropia of the right eye and parents, uh, and parents reduced, uh, noticed reduced uh, vision in the left eye for one month. This is the appearance of the right eye and you can see the presence of this pseudocoloboma and an open macular hole with a localized detachment at the area of the coloboma. And this is the left eye. You can see that there is detachment and this is the OCT with like a flap tear on the, on the macula. And the own surgery with silicon oil and this is the appearance after, uh, after silicon oil removal. So um, this is uh, important to keep in mind that patients with no block syndrome could present with the macular hole related retinal detachment, especially in early childhood. The condition may be easily overlooked if not suspected. Uh, surgical management involves careful dissection of the posterior hyaloid. Down syndrome is a, the most common chromosomal abnormality in humans with ocular manifestations ranging from refractive errors to retinal detachment 
with a rate of 1.7 percent in the in the literature. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, usually publishes a, a report uh, like guidelines uh, for healthcare of patients with Down syndrome and the ophthalmologic uh, part. Uh, uh, this was in 2011. The ophthalmologic part uh, is, uh, starts with re red reflex exam at birth, examination by uh, pediatric ophthalmologist within six months, annual exam until the age of five years, uh, every two years until 13 years of age, then every three years uh, after that. So we did a study, that we looked at our patients here in KKR. Um, it was a retrospective chart review with uh, patients with Down syndrome and retinal detachment from 1995 to 2014. Um, we had a total of two, uh, 245 patients with Down syndrome and 18 eyes of 15 patients with 6.1% uh, had retinal detachment. 11 were males and four females. Uh, the mean age was uh, 11 years at presentation. And this is important because of the point that I'll highlight later. Uh, three out of 15 patients presented with bilateral retinal detachment, and all eyes had macular off retinal detachment. 83% had a total retinal detachment. A history of ocular trauma uh, or head trauma was present in one th around one third of the patients. Two eyes presented with the proliferative vitreal retinopathy grade B, and six eyes presented with the grade C. So around 50% they had PVR at the presentation. Eight eyes, eight eyes presented with horseshoe tear, uh, three eyes presented with giant retinal tear, six eyes with atroph atrophic or, or percolated holes, one eye with retinal dialysis, and uh, in one eye the break was unidentifiable. So uh, some patients had vitrectomy with buckle, some patients had buckle alone, and one patient only had vitrectomy alone, which highlights the complexity of detachments in these eyes. Tamponade wa used was either silicon oil or long-acting long gas. The retina was successfully reattached after one procedure and uh, uh, around 66%, and after a second procedure, an additional 22%, so the total is around 89%, not bad, uh, but uh, it's difficult uh, to assess anatomic uh, visual outcome in these patients. I'm sure it's not as good. So why Down syndrome are, patients are predisposed to retinal detachment? One is that self-induced trauma may be implicated as a cause of retinal detachment in mentally retarded uh, patients. Many Down syndromes, uh, many Down syndrome patients are myopes. So, significant proportion of uh, patients with Down syndrome presented with severe BVR. Uh, so, period, we think that periodic evaluation is important, and we believe that the American Academy uh, of Pediatrics recommendation are inadequate. Uh, at the current time, at, at the last publication, uh, to detect retinal detachment and Down syndrome in a reasonable time. So our patients' average age, uh, mean age at presentation was 11 years. Most of them had total chronic PVR uh, detachments. Um, and at, from after five years, it is every two years exam. I think uh, there, is a, there is a high chance that detachment will be missed for a very long time. So, last uh, syndrome. This is a seven-year-old female. She was following as a possible stickler syndrome with high myopia, minus 25 diopters in both eyes, and baseline vision of 2200. She presented with acute loss of vision to light perception in the left eye. So we saw her in ER. She didn't have the facial features of Stickler, no exhibital defect of uh, no block. Uh, this is the anterior segment exam. You can see that this is after dilating drops, by the way. The pupil is very tiny and does not respond to dilation. 
So we asked them if any systemic issues. Uh, the parents mentioned that she and her uh, myopic brother suffer from proteinuria. So this is the fundus appearance of the right eye. You can see there is, uh, this is with optus. Luckily, you can see more. So optus is an exam tool in pediatric uh, patients. It's not only for documentation. So you can see this uh, punched out atrophic lesion here. You can see the, the uh, va vasculature appears uh, abnormal. And this is the appearance of the left eye, total detachment. Um, so um, this is the diagnosis, Pearson syndrome. It is an autosomal recessive uh, disease described in 1963. Mutation in laminin beta 2 gene characterized by congenital nephrotic syndrome of uh, variable severity and the peculiar ocular finding. Microchoria, it was present in 32 of, uh, out of th uh, 34 patients in, one, in the largest series in the literature. So other ocular findings include shallow anterior chamber, glaucoma, cataract, spherophakia, persistent fetal vasculature, high myopia, retinal detachment, and foveal hypoplasia. So uh, some challenges in, in surgery in this uh, disease is with, during management of the, uh, of the pupil, you can see when we put visco viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, the lens was pushed way, way back in the mid vitreous. The zonules were very weak. It was very difficult to, to keep the lens in this, uh, in this eye. So the, the hyaloid was very adherent to the, an area uh, to the posterior pole and the retina beyond the near periphery was avascular. Uh, you can see it was very white, no, ves no vessels in it. The breaks were very posterior at the edge of the vascular, avascular junction. Um, so it was impossible to get the hyaloid beyond the, uh, beyond the vascular uh, part of the uh, retina. We lasered the breaks, and uh, I decided to perform uh, 360 laser to the, to the what looks like a very ischemic retina in the periphery. So this is the appearance postoperatively. She uh, recovered her baseline uh, vision. Um, Aphecic with aphecic correction with silicon oil in the eye. So we performed the fluorescein angiography and it confirmed what we saw that you see the vasculature stops here, nothing beyond this area. All of this is avascular. Well, we still don't know why LAMP2 mutations would cause ischemia. It is involved in uh, basement membranes. Maybe it is involved in basement membranes of blood vessels. We are not sure. One report of uh, a similar disease of laminin mutations uh, showed that they have early, these patients develop early posterior vitreous detachment, which predisposed them to um, uh, retinal detachment. Um, those patients usually have severe renal disease and they die early in life. So this is an extremely rare disease to see. But usually uh, they, uh, when they come, they come with retinal detachment. Thank you. This is the uh, end of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sulaiman, for this really interesting presentations that give all the lights of what we are looking for as a difficulties. This is young patients coming in the 
pediatric ages, if you cannot do something for them, mostly they are ended by blindness, which is really it's another burden for the families and even though recognizing these cases in early stages is an important for Questions before we get in the comments of the answers. Questions? So why do you think they are prone to this uh, presentation of detachment? Very interesting. What we found uh, in, uh, in surgery is that the, uh, the vitreomacular vitro adhesion is very strong. Why would they do have vitreo macular adhe a strong vitreomacular adhesion compared to patients with uh, secular, uh, secular pa or patients with secular syndrome is I, I, don't, I, I don't have an explanation anatomically why. Why collagen 18 would cause more, would, would be more likely to have a macular hole compared to collagen 2, collagen 9, or collagen 11, for example. So I came across animal study where they induced this mutation and they found that there is no ILM. So do you think this is the possible, I mean, explanation? I tried it myself to, I mean, stay in the ILM, there is basically nothing. So yeah, me too. So the, there is no ILM. Is, maybe this is uh, playing a role in this uh, uh, Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it is possible. The problem is that here, the abnormal fit retinal interface here, it might be already dispelled by the abnormal vitreous when it's that from the area. I think so we need to, when we do such cases, that you can get the samples, you know, and send it for the, you know, histopathology that we can recognize if there is or not. I think so better than just because the, this is, I think, so uh, abnormal interfitreal interface pathology, usually it might be the cause of this. I can comment in what he said. I think so, you know, the spectrum, Dr. Suleiman presented from the, you know, sticklers to myopes, then to Down syndromes, and then you go to the person syndromes. I think this apparatus of the disease, but mentioning the Down syndromes, usually I think so, these patients coming to us, usually neglected. Nobody is looking for them. They are not actually based on their mental uh, retardation levels. They cannot express their issues of visual loss. So they came to us on this list. I, I, I've been that operated in a couple of patients. They came in the wheelchair with the, you know, that, um, um, what's that so-called, the um, uh, mentally retarded uh, housing cares, you know. And they coming, nobody is known. Usually they have cyanica, cataract, and everything at the end stage. Uh, but I'm really supporting your idea. This patient need to have regular, you know, uh, fundus exams. Uh, you mentioned clearly that um, uh, you know that uh, optus is one of the good you know tools to uh, uh, to examine this patient. It might be even though that we are highly specialized people, sometimes we can miss things, you know, especially in these kids. Doing um, optus usually give you more, you know, broad uh, peripheral uh, retinal view. Uh, I think this is very well need to be in, uh, uh, taken into considerations in these patients. Doctor Salva.
express themselves, so they tend to be neglected. Because, you know, a wheel that doesn't squeak doesn't get a wheel. You know, this is a common thing. So every time we get a, a Down syndrome, and they do have a retinal detachment, we shiver. Because we're worried about the other eye. And we tend to go in and just do whatever prophylaxis we can do. Because we know they might not come back, and if they do come back, it might be a bilateral retinal detachment. I want to thank you. The way you did the syndromes was just so elegant. From that point, um, I, what I wanted to ask, not really, ask, maybe it's more of a comment. Have you come against um, um, the non syndromic, non attachment uh, patients uh, that, you know, they're born blind, they have their bilateral uh, retinal detachment, but there's no syndrome? Because we have, like, uh, we've, we've run into four families that we're trying to gather up. And so interesting with these non syndromic that we found out that there's a big family, an Iranian family, Kurdish, from Iran, that actually um, have practically the same uh, phenotype. So we did, you know, we now have, I don't know if people know, we have now a vision panel that's done at the Saudi Diagnostic Lab. Anyone can order it. It's not just restricted to the any face of it. It doesn't, you know, in the vision panel, we don't have all. So now we, you know, we go one further step and you do what we call the West. Wide exome sequencing. But even in those non syndromic, we've had problems with that because sometimes they're, they're in trance and they're further out and you have to specifically look for them. Have you seen Dr. Bibi, which is the man who's non syndromic? Have you come across them? Because we like, we have these patients, it would be nice to gather them. Yes, we, uh, you know, for Saudi Arabia, not so much for the face of Personally, I haven't seen. Uh, patients with non-syndromic retinal detachments in, in infancy, other than the, the youngest is uh, the three-month-old no block patient. Yeah, I've been yani, away a little bit from the pediatric retina, but in the past that, in my career during 2003-2004, we have found patients with retinal dysgenesis, you know, retinal dysgenesis that found with unusual retinal, you know, folds, and uh, uh, disorganized retina, we don't know what is the cause, and uh, was with full terms, you know, spontaneous vaginal uh, uh, delivery, and we don't know at that time. But might be this is fit what you said. There is no that obvious, you know, uh, dysmorphic features in these patients. It would be nice if you can identify those, send them to the SDM. I will try to get back to this genesis diagnosis, ret retinal dysgenosis. Regarding to what you mentioned, that Saudi genomes, they are giving us the now the opportunity to do full SOMS, you know, uh, analysis, and it is free and through the CACs actually now can be easy. You can apply for it, and inshallah we have a lot. I have one questions for you, doctors. You know, I have two types of patients with myopsia: the stickler syndromes, and the other in the other half that the patient with high myopes, which is doesn't have the same characteristic. What is the cause of stretching, you know, this part of the fundus in the stickler syndrome to make it, you know, as we do that in the patient with ROBs, which is making difference from the patient who's having just real myopes, you know, or let us to say hereditary so myopes. Your question is uh, why stickler uh, phenotype is as it is compared to other, the non-syndromic myopes. Uh, I, I think it's related to... Uh, uh, the genetic defect, um, the gene, the collagen uh, 2, collagen 9, and collagen uh, 11 um, is, involved, is in the vitreous. So uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at them, they have this abnormal vitreous in addition to abnormal retina, but they have abnormal vitreous as well. So that might be the cause of this stretching and making elongations of these blood vessels among the temporal part of the macula. I think this is one. You mentioned that the lacquer cracks and the late complications of the myopic patients. Do you think that it might be developed at this age or it might need a little bit, you know, enlargement of the axial length yeah. and then having some stretch over the uh, sclera and thinning by Usually, the... usually uh, if, you, if, uh, if you read the literature on pathologic myopia, 
Usually develops after the age of 40. All these, co co uh, the, uh, the part of biliary atrophy, the chororetinal atrophy in the macula, and the development of uh, lacquer cracks, hemorrhage, CMV. So it is, it is, uh, so it is age related uh, process. Um, maybe that's why in the description of Arif Khan of LRVAB1, um, there were no patients with this finding. Um, yeah. If anyone has, yeah, Dr. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this comprehensive uh, coverage. I have one question: uh, Is there any rule of prophylactic laser for any stickler patients who insist to have fake IL implantation? Put in mind that we are seeing a lot of RDs following uh, ICL or artisanal implantation nowadays. So. Uh, we discussed this is this is all the literature on stickler prophylaxis. There is nothing that is uh, worth mentioning that I did not discuss. But looking at prophylaxis in general, if you have an axial myopia of minus six or more, prophylactic treatment was was found not to be beneficial. No, I'm talking about the picky guy. Also, meaning that it's very high male. Yes. What should we do with anything you know, that is like minus six or, and above, or or more? And one large study, anything that is minus six or worse. Prophylactic treatment around lattice was not found to be of benefit compared to the control group. Okay, very interesting. On the other hand, I noticed that a few years ago when we used to implant an artisan as a, a method of correction of aphicic, uh, you know, uh, uh, in aphicic patients with marfans, uh, the, they tend to develop the RD within almost one year. So we stopped doing that. When I searched the, the, the literature, I found a couple of case reports that supported uh, the, the RD development following artisan implantation in aphic patients is associated with high rate of RD. So that's one thing. That's about the Marfan. So I'm talking now about, about the other syndrome. So yeah, we did one yesterday, Marfan Artisan, three years old. Yeah. Yeah, three hours uh, surgery. It's, it's really one of the most uh, challenging yeah, way. Because of the intervention. So meaning that we're not going to refer to these patients. They do VI mostly, you know? Yes, they do. And this is, might be the area where, you know, the people are starting to be having dynamic status, uh -huh. you know? And this is the one that, uh, you see. know, that the enemy, I think so. I don't think so, the surgery itself, the putting the artisan itself. Well, well, we have an, um, a theory that when you put an artisan in effective patients with Marfan, uh, the, their iris is not normal because uh, when we tend to, to uh, do the inclination, it's really very difficult and the iris is very thin. So probably the, the, the movement of the iris lens, uh, iris or diaphragm, is, is one of the things that, so, that predisposed to the development. So meaning that... We don't have to refer any patients for retina before any fecal gyal implantation. In these cases? In uh, all these, whether it's Marfan or Stickler, cases? right? And you deserve to have it. You don't, you don't recommend I that. I think we right? should examine and see if there are breaks that should be treated. Okay. Uh, I agree, only, but yeah. doing a 360 prophylaxis blindly, I'm not. Okay. I'm, I'm against this uh, approach to any. And definitely we stop doing artisan and Marfan's probably. Yes, thank you. Even none of the majors are attending because this is a very interesting subject. Um, uh, my, my question is, um, you tend to have those patients uh, who present with an RD in one eye, and then you discover that they have an RD in the other eye, and it's been there for a very long time. And you know how, how things are very complicated once you go into this eye, whether you do a buckle alone or, or a vitrectomy and a buckle. So um, what's, what, what do you think in terms of of a patient who, who's been stable for a long time and he has this RD, and you know that he's been in this uh, situation for a long time, would you be very inclined to go up and, and operate on this eye or, or keep a close observation? So localized RD, macula on in a child, giant, giant the tear. other eye is? Giant tear. Uh, giant tear is, um, I would do surgery for him. Okay, and, and what about uh, cases with, with, uh, with the localized RD and, and the yeah, localized RD, atrophic, uh, peripheral, subclinical, I may laser, barrage laser around that uh, detachment. 
uh, if it is more going posteriorly, I think uh, buckle is a good option here. I think what you said is that important to back to our classification, subclinical, peripheral. Is there any demarcation lines that beyond them you can decide? Okay. Um, uh, my, my other question is, is uh, uh, about uh, the cases where you actually uh, go in, you cannot peel the high load, it's very adherent, and you, you're planning on doing another surgery. Uh, it's been described as that PFCL as, or a heavy liquid as a tamponade uh, for a very short time uh, has been used. Um, you tend to have this problem where you, where, where you uh, exchange the perfluorone with, 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 uh, and, and you get the slippage. Would you keep the perfluorone in some of these eyes? Have you had this experience before? I haven't uh, done it personally, but uh, it is described in inferior pathology and in eyes that you have to go in after two weeks and remove perfluorone and uh, uh, so if, if you say that you are, your, your concern is slippage, uh, slippage could be managed without leaving perfluorone in the eye and uh, either you do what I mentioned, the slow fluid exchange uh, or the PFCL or as you know, the direct exchange uh, I think this should solve the problem. I don't, I don't see the advantage of leaving uh, perfluorone um, to tamponade inferior pathology now. We have heavy silicon oil that could uh, do the same job. And without, without rushing the patient to OR in two weeks, three weeks to avoid inflammation because of the perfluorone. Yes, so heavy silicon oil could do the same job. Thank you. I like your comments in the prophylactic treatment. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> which is really great to mention that putting um, uh, um, scleral buckle is here can bad in this patient is not an easy. And you might be the eye is clat retina and with the ethanol, reticular surgeons they might have penetrations. And once you have that, might the case will progress. Doing surgery lasers, laser might be by itself it might be the risking factor for uh, for uh, deploying of that. So we have to be careful. And I think this is individualized case is not we have to apply as a rule for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman. It's really great Thank to have this. One so, more. Uh, one comment question regarding Dr. Dr. Samar uh, uh, question. So basically at Kekish we uh, did a study here to compare complication, written complication of, of artisan, the ICL, and compare it to the LASIK also. So basically, there is no significant difference between the rate of retinal complication. So the baseline is these patients are at risk. So what I would advise that to explain to the patient the possibility of having the retinal detachment ahead of time. So, but as a cause, is, is there like causative relation between the ICL or artisan or even LASIK uh, treatment and the written detachment is hard to tell. Thank you. But if you are, you have a patient, as you said, and getting back, and patient requesting to have refractive surgery, what you will advise with all this finding of the retina? I mean, this here, you cannot see. It's really actually blind without even toe. So you have to be any uh, careful when you are discussing these issues. You will go for refractive surgery or not? Personally, no. I showed you the literature. You, um, everyone, everyone can decide for himself. I will not do prophylaxis.
انا ما اسمعك زين دكتور ممكن ترفع صوتك شوي In uh, Pearson syndrome, I believe there is, uh, along with the early PVD, there is uh, an element of uh, vitro, vitro retinal traction, not only the macula, also the periphery. And uh, I went in one of the eyes, and uh, there was uh, like a traction retinal detachment, uh, which can obviously will develop into a break and a total detachment. Most of the yeah. cases is presented, most of them have infractions. Yes, but uh, uh, this is uh, an extremely rare disease, and it is uh, not very common to find people who operated on such eyes. So it's good to have feedback of anyone who has experience of, with these eyes. From your videos, uh, that I think this is they have more than يعني, pathology. Regarding the posterior vitreous glassman, they have vitreous cases. It's not easy usually to build it as usual, so they have some tractional component. What's if for you? But keeping working in them, by the end you might at least to clean up as much as possible of the vitreous will help vitreous to be stabilized. Yes. It's really Thank you, all of you, for your uh, tendency and this discussions. Thank you, Dr. Sleiman. Thank you. And going for quiz now, huh? No. Would you like to start the quiz now? Quiz now. Would you like it or not? You would like. Guys. Quiz now or later? This is it. What time is the quiz? I'm going to go. Sure. I'm going to go. I'm
that is your experience with this. C3, if it's not a traction, I don't know. I don't know. لا كلش يلا نبدا يا شباب فيصل يلا ريدي يلا فيرست كويستشن Can you dim the lights, please? So, which zone, stage, plus or not? This is A. B, define plus disease. This is the second picture. So, this is the first one. This is the second one. Same patient, same eye, but more peripheral image. This is enough. So to make it, uh, this is the most posterior part of it. Okay, question number two. So this is A, what type of silicon oil? And this is B, what is the type of silicon oil here? Question three. This is an eight-year-old boy referred for evaluation of macular lesions. What is the diagnosis? And what is the most common mode of inheritance? Question four. 
This is a 28 year old male complaining of decreased vision in the right eye for two years. Visual acuity is 2160 in the right, improved with correction to 2080. So A, diagnosis, B, mentioned two possible causes of vision loss in this condition. Question five. This is a 48 year old Saudi male with no medical illness, complaining of decreased vision in the right eye for two weeks. Visual activity in the right eye is 2200. Intraocular pressure is 24 millimeter of mercury. A. Describe the findings. B. Diagnosis. C. Treatment. This is the image. This is the fluorescein. Early, fluorescein late. So describing the findings and the three images. So one, two, three. This one. Okay. Last question, bonus question. So this is a 55-year-old female with diabetes and hypertension, complaining of decreased vision in the right eye for one month. VA2040, plus two cells and, and plus two vitreous cells, and haze. And this is the fundus image. This is the fluorescein. So the question is, what is the diagnosis? What is the management? A 55 year old female, diabetes, hypertension, decreased vision in the right eye for one month, AC reaction, vitreous haze, and this is the fundus appearance.
يلا كان وي كولكت ذا بيبرز بليز ريبيت وات ويتش كويستشن فيرست وان So this is the. Sorry. Ma smack. This is the most posterior part. So you can stay. You can uh, zone it based on the most posterior part. And there is no detachment in the nasal part. Yalla, let's collect the papers, please. <laughs> this is the question four. This one.
خلاص كذا بقى احد هذا رقم اربعه يلا ليتس جو تو ذا انسرز بليز عشان يمديكم تصلون قبل المجن كونفرنس So, who wants to answer this? Ahmed? Ahmed Arbaan? Okay. So, this is stage three. It is zone two. So, it is pre plus. Venus to Venus what? Venus. Okay. So to what to what degree? Yeah. What degree? Do you know what degree of Venus dilation and tortuosity? We always say this. We know the the definition, but uh, the dilation and tortuosity. There is a standard photograph uh, that. That was published. That you can relate, you can compare your findings to, and it is not a very good picture, but it is very, very uh, aggressive appearing uh, dilation and tortuosity. So this is not a very uh, uh, there. Are, there is tortuosity here, some dilation, but it did not reach the degree that you call it uh, plus disease. So, who wants to answer this? Khalid Al Musa. Fi Khalid Al Musa. Or the Gary Al-Asim Galatan. Second year, Program B. Okay. Abdullah Al Jnaidan. الجنيدل correct So the the uh, your answer is correct. Five thousand, one thousand, ten thousand, whatever the number. This is not the molecular weight. This is the viscosity. So it it is not related to uh, floating or sinking down. So this is regular silicon oil. This is the heavy silicon oil. سارة سارة هلالي يعني ار ريم طيب وات از ذس اوكي كوركت Who will take this? The previous question, this is best disease, autosomal dominant. So let's discuss it more. Um, <laughs> um, tell, do you know uh, other modes of inheritance for this disease? What is it called? Autosomal recessive best trophenopathy. Um, it has a different uh, presentation. It is uh, if you uh, 
the one who described it is Patrick Chats, our uh, retina, medical retina colleague. <clears throat> so, who will take this? What do you think of this? This is normal? Okay. Not only shadowing, there are like uh, trabiculi, you know, the bone trabiculi. Mm. So, your diagnosis? B. Like so. So there is a um, suggestion that if you give the patient calcium, vitamin D, trying to maintain uh, the calcification of the tumor, this will prevent progression to uh, decalcification. We don't know if this is true or not. Who will take this? حد بيجاوب؟ لا خل خل غيرك. محمد العبد العال. So tell me about the fluorescein findings. Okay. What is the treatment? Okay. Anything? Okay. Sam. True. So I presented this in my fourth year of residency as one of the complications of uh, toxoplasmosis. It can cause BRAO, it can cause BRVO, it can cause CMVM, um, and uh, good catch. Who will answer this? Yalarin. Yes. What if I saw it? A whitish uh, re uh, peripheral retinal, uh, retinal lesion, well demarcated, um, uh, seems to be retinal, uh, with surrounded uh, uh, peri uh, or vasculitis, uh, vascular sheathing basically, and uh, vitreous haze. Mm -hmm. um, the diagnosis uh, in the uh, fundus uh, fluorescein uh, shows. Uh, seems to be capillary leakage because this is a uh, late uh, uh, photo. Mm -hmm. um, 
with the hard disk. Diagnosis. Um, uh, acute retinal necrosis. Management. Um, we can give a systemic acyclovir, antiviral, mm -hmm. and intravitreal uh, baby foscarnet. Um, no, uh, because foscarnet is not intravitreal. Um, uh, you, you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Gan cyclovir, yeah. Anything else? Um, Before you give anything. I'm talking about management, I'm not talking about treatment, management. So what are you going to do to the patient before you initiate the treatment? Before giving him possibly lifelong antiviral treatment? You will confirm the diagnosis, right? Yeah, with and the how? Uh, the chest tab? A C tab. Mm, a C tab, tab is, uh, is enough. Mm. So I want you to keep this picture in mind. So this is how it progresses. Hmm? Then like this. Then heals. Then breaks and retinal detachment. Hmm. Hmm. Any questions? Yeah, thank you.